It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Marina Anderson. Hi, Marina. How are Hi. you? Hi. How are you doing? I took my vitamin B this morning, so I'm really hyped. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. We like that. I, I love guests that want to talk rather than ones that want to sleep through the interview. <laughs> Just Always call me good. Miss Gabby. <laughs> so, lots of stuff on your bio, as we were talking about before we got on. Let's start mm -hmm. with the Media Hound PR, which is your company, right? Yes, yes. Um, I kind of segued in, back into doing publicity and, you know, got to pay the bills. <laughs> so acting is, uh, for uh, most of actors, uh, are, is kind of a gaps in between. So I, I shifted into that um, back in 2012. And uh, I worked for, uh, I won't name the company, but um, my uh, associates who I'm still in touch with, we affectionately called it the snake pit. <laughs> it was a... <laughs> Uh, a, a big firm in Beverly Hills, a PR company. And, um, you know, we just got to a point where it's like, I, I am working my butt off and getting paid not that much money. Um, I want to do this my way. Um, so I, I quit and um, formed the Media Hound PR. And I have my lovely colleague, Lulu, as my logo. That was Daughter of Lassie 8, by the way. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I see the picture. I'm still in touch with. He's got a great book. You've got to interview him. Um, yeah, so uh, I have wonderful clients like Alan Parsons, um, Ed Bigley Jr., Donnie Most. Um, I helped push Robbie Benson's book. Um, and and they've become very good, you know, dear friends to me. So it's been really a lovely journey. Robbie Benson. Now, there's a blast from the past. I, rem yeah. I remember that movie he did in the 70s, uh, Ode to Billy Joe. Oh, my gosh. He's done so much. Yeah. yeah. And, and the voice of, of Beauty and the Beast. And um, he's constantly posting on Facebook uh, fabulous songs that he writes with his wonderfully talented wife, Carla. And oh, okay. um, so uh, we keep in touch. Yeah, he was somebody I, I kind of grew up with. I suspect yeah. him and I are around the same age. So <laughs> that's probably why. <laughs> there you go. The other thing I was intrigued by on your bio, amongst many things, was you're a cousin to Peter O'Toole. Yes. Oh. How about that? How about I met him that? once. <laughs> you met him once, yeah? I met him once. It was uh, at the Four Seasons uh, during uh, Oscars week, and um, I, saw, I saw him across the room. And I, I went up to him and I said, um, excuse me, Peter, um, but I believe we're related. We're cousins. And he looked me up and down and he went, Hello! <laughs> <laughs> he was just so unbelievably charming. I mean, my favorite year was one of my favorite movies, not to mention um, you know, Lawrence of Arabia and all that. Um, and he was just lovely. Um, so I'm related to him through, okay, my, my, follow this lineage. My granduncle was Harry Joe Brown, who produced the Randolph Scott Westerns. And um, his son, Harry Joe Jr., who we called Coco, had a daughter, Morgan, and Morgan's mom, Karen, who um, was married to Coco, <laughs> um, she later um, connected up with Peter O'Toole. So I am um, related through my cousin, Morgan Brown, who has been, you know, the off and on, um, but mostly on um, a love of um, uh, Gerard Butler. Hollywood trivia. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, interesting trivia. It's so Hollywood, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So is Peter O'Toole really just as flamboyant as in real life as he was on screen? Uh, well, I mean, I, flamboyant in what, in what way do you well, mean? Well, <laughs> very kind of, I don't know. I mean, I've only seen interviews and in the, the way he acts, but he seemed, with the exception of Lawrence of Arabia, which he played sort of very straight, but I mean, he... Flamboyant. He had a bon vivant sort of personality. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, that. Okay. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It was just um, effervescent, kind of a charm and um, twinkle in his eye, and and um, uh, ever so British. You know, it's like and, uh, and I, so I, British. I adored him. Yeah, he was just lovely. Uh, you know, the cigarette with the holder 
and just sort of his oh, posture. Oh, I didn't see his... him smoking. Okay. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, you know. <laughs> All right. It's its style. Let me ask you something <laughs> about the PR industry, because uh, we, mm. we work with a lot of different PR companies, most of them in L.A., a couple in New York that are more representative of authors. Has social media been a burden or a blessing to PR? Oh, geez. Um, it, it's both. It's both. Um, in, in the downside, there is just so much content out there. Um, um, and, and during COVID, you know, they pretty much had every name available, you know, to do interviews. So it was really difficult to, you know, get in there. You know, I, Frank Sloan, I've done PR work for two. And, um, and um, it was certain names, like Frank, I said, that's easy. But when you have um, someone who just has a book launch and their, their name isn't known, it's a lot, it's, it's like five times as much work to try and get them out there and seen. Uh, it's the be seen thing because there is so much content out there. But then again, on the plus side, you have more avenues to get your, your you know, client out there and noticed and whatnot. So it, it is definitely a double-edged sword. Yeah, I've heard that analogy used. And I've, I've heard the analogy of, like, the freeway. And in, yeah. the Internet sort of doubled the size of the freeway, but now there's mm -hmm. 10 million more cars on it. And they're going, uh, you know, 500 miles an hour. It's, the attention span is like... Beep, 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 yeah. Beep. You know, it, they don't want to get into anything in depth. It's all kind of superficial, or, or unless it's exploitational, and then it kind of grabs your interest. It's like, oh, what was that? Ooh, mm. And then next. So... It's very different from what it was like 10 years ago. It seems to me, though, from the content creator's perspective, who would be hiring PR, that it, it's almost more essential now to have PR because as great as your content might be, it's just not going to get seen unless you've got somebody on your side, you know, shouting through the megaphone to get you noticed. Right. Yeah? right. You need, you need the, um, the, the navigator so to speak. Right. It's just not going to sell itself anymore like it might have years ago. Right. And you also need someone who can write. I mean, I have a you know, huge background in writing, so it's to, to write the, you know, the, what's going to catch their interest or, you know, uh, to, to get it seen. And, you know, most of the pitches are not by phone anymore. It's by electronic email. And there's so much spam in the email. You, things get lost. Um, so, hmm. It's a lot of work. So you need the PR company almost becomes sort of like an organizer, somebody who knows where they can push your content to get the maximum um, exposure. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, also, I kind of have a, a managerial, uh, like a personal manager sort of um, feel to uh, things when I represent clients. Um, that's why I'm, I don't take on that many because I really concentrate. It's not like I have... 15 on my roster and I can only spend like an hour 45 minutes a day on each one it's ridiculous I don't want to have a staff I I am really kind of territorial and and I like I like to control it myself to see what's going on to make sure things are done the way I feel that it should so um yeah <laughs> is is the bigger the name the less PR they need or is that not true that's not true um because there is so much content now you know, depending on who it is and what their project is or what they're trying to push, um, you there's more interest in them, so you get more requests, and there's more things to filter out, and then there's more things to push for them too, more territory. You know, I'm just looking at some of your uh, your client list. I think Mia Savino was on our show years ago. Oh, uh, we didn't work together, but we were in the Red Maple Leaf, the, the film, the same film. Okay. I have to look it up because we've done like 700 <laughs> at this point. Oh, my so gosh. I kind of forget. But I know, her yeah. I know her name, and I remember talking to her mm -hmm. at some point. So Yeah, okay. wonderful actress. Yeah. yeah um, that, that, that film was filled with, with stars um, up the wazoo, um, directed by Frank D'Angelo out of um, Toronto. Multi-talented uh, director, producer, songwriter, singer—you <laughs> name it—he's doing it. And uh, he did the film *The Red Maple Leaf*, and it was very interesting. Chris Christopherson. I kind of reunited with Chris Christopherson because my ex-father-in-law, Michael Anderson, Sr., um, directed a film that he did 
Um, and uh, I met him on set. This is back in the 90s. And so fast forward on this film, um, you know, I was like, oh, Chris, we met in Toronto. And, oh, my God. So we took a picture together. <laughs> it was pretty cool. Um, remember him at the Troubadour in the 70s? See, I'm dating myself. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's nice when that comes full circle and you reconnect with people. So you've got a book, best-selling author, David Carradine, The Eye of My Tornado. Uh, from, right. what, from what I can read through this, uh, it sounds like your relationship with David was tumultuous, to say the least. It, it was wonderful the first three years, three and a half years. And then um, sometime after we got married, um, <laughs> David didn't want to do anything himself. He, I was like the secretary, the, the PR person, the, <laughs> the housemate, the wife, the girlfriend. You know, I was kind of like the do-all. And as soon as I started, hey, you, you got to dial your own phone numbers to call people. I can't do it for you, you know started delegating for him to be more responsible, then things started kind of going wonky. And then, of course, um, and I was way ahead of my time writing about this. Um, it was kind of like the Fifty Shades of Grey going in there, um, along with the um, Me Too thing, um, but in the sense that um, what I wrote about, and I do not out the person, but it was in court documents that came out, smoking gun, and um, so there was incest perpetrated on a family member. Hmm. And uh, when people go, oh, oh, you're you're you know doing this, and you're, you how horrible for you to say that. I had Dr. Drew Pinsky verbatim in my book, with his blessing, he endorsed the book um, because I wanted to resolve issues that I hadn't worked through yet from my childhood, which was being molested by my father's brother. So you fast forward to the relationship with David; it was attraction of. Ooh, what is this darkness? Ooh, this is like really intriguing. Um, finding out later, fast forward, that that was um, the abuse, as Dr. Chu put it, I'm paraphrasing. Um, you, you, sometimes you're more likely to be attracted um, to um, someone who will oblige, per se, in that abuse. And then I, I, you know, David was very open about telling me about what he had done, and um, I thought this was my mission to help him. I thought this was my mission to help uh, heal myself and um, to work through these problems. And so I stayed in the relationship, and obviously we got married. And fast forward, he did not want to work with those issues. And then we started really having problems and growing further and further apart, that which got you know, to the point where I had to divorce or I was going down with the ship. And that was really heartbreaking for both of us because we were still very much in love with each other. But it was not a healthy situation, by any means, for me. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy, right here on The Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Douglas Coleman's Don't Do a Podcast is a dryly humorous rant about Douglas's pet peeve, the unrelenting torrent of podcasts hitting the web on a constant basis. As technology has put podcasting within the reach of anyone, many wholly unqualified people have taken the plunge. This witty polemic tries to persuade them from broadcasting their drivel using Douglas's brand of sarcastic humor. Now on Amazon, only 99 cents. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of The Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Love coffee, huh? But wait a minute. It seems like every time you finish a cup of coffee, you get all of these side effects along with it. 
heartburn, digestion, upset stomach, acid reflux. As the world's first and only organic acid-free coffee, Tyler's Coffee is able to provide a healthier option in the solution for more than 100 million individuals who have sensitive stomachs or suffer from acid-related modalities. This is Tyler's Acid-Free Coffee. Coffee without the consequences. Hi, this is John Morgan, Production Supervisor for DJC Productions. You're listening to The Douglas Coleman Show. So when he died in Thailand, this was 2009? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. 2009, yeah. Uh, What was the condition or the status of your relationship at that point? Was it still good or was it on the way? No. No. When we divorced, it was, um, we did keep in touch for a while, but he was not being honorable what he promised my mother. Um, fast track this for your show. Um, when we got when we were together, he was about a quarter of a, you know three quarters of a million dollars in debt to the IRS, and so therefore he couldn't put his name on any property. So when we wanted to get a house, my mother took the loan out for the house, six hundred fifty thousand dollar loan. My mother was like eighty two at the time. With the promise that they was going to pay the mortgage and keep up on everything, and so we could have this beautiful home in Tarzana, south of the boulevard, very expensive area. And um, when we separated and I filed for divorce, he stopped paying for the mortgage, and I didn't have the money to pay because he stopped paying me my commissions. Mm. And uh, that was the money I was living off of, and my life savings was the deposit for the home. So um, they, the bank wanted like forty grand for my mother, and I we had to sell it on a short sale to get her out of the debt problem and clear her name. I couldn't forgive him for that. So, um, but he didn't seem to have any problem with that. So things like that happened. So it became very adversarial, and I had to take him to court to try and collect money that was due me. And no, it was not not a pretty picture. But so when Kill Bill came around, we were still in the middle of all the court stuff. Okay. It's not a, not a happy time. But I'm reading through this, though, and it, it I don't want to say it's conflicting, but it's interesting that on the one hand, your relationship with David at the time he died mm-hmm. was obviously not great. You guys were having mm-hmm. a lot of problems, financial and certainly emotions that are attached to it. On the other side right. of this, it says that you were very active in finding out the truth about his death, where some, right. which would lead me to believe that there was deep concern for him from you. Right. Because somebody who yeah, didn't I, care would I never lost the love for that. him. Yeah. It, what he did was not good. But, you know, you, you come to a point where you um, have to let go to a certain extent and forgive. And, you know, I kind of try to look at things as a spiritual journey of what we're supposed lessons we're supposed to learn and that was part of it all that was part of it so I I finally got to a point where I let go of um, the anger and and kind of looked at it differently and so when all that happened it really hit me hard I mean I could go to tears now thinking that you know things that you still wanted to say and unresolved things and then when I saw the autopsy pictures and he was wearing a duplicate ring of our wedding ring. He he said he lost it, but I think he kind of tossed it when we <laughs> separated. And then I ran into him in a store, and he was. I looked at his hand, and I said, Th- "You found the ring?" And he goes, "No, it's it's a, a duplicate." And I was like, "What? Why would you be you're, you're remarried? Why would you be wearing the same?" And he just looked at me and shrugged his shoulders like quite chain cane, like is what it is, mm. kind of thing. And and so I felt he never fell out of love. And I heard from other people who, mutual friends and relatives and whatnot, he hadn't really let go either. So when I saw the, that in the autopsy pictures, I just felt hurt. And it was just really, that was hard. Yeah. yeah. So interestingly, I was in Thailand in 2009. I was teaching English. Mm. So I was really? living, but not in Bangkok. I was about 300 miles north. But it made oh. big news. And, yeah, uh, you know the sort I would of, think. and and when the case started to go, well, I mean, I, I read things like I didn't know you specifically, <laughs> but I, you know, David Carradine's family is not 
uh, satisfied with the Thailand's police department's work, right. blah, 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 cover up conspiracy, all of that. I thought, well, yeah, okay, because I was very familiar with how it was in Thailand with the police. I mean, they they are just blatantly corrupt, and anything that is going to mm. tarnish the image of Thailand as this tourist oasis, anything that's going to compromise that, uh, particularly a, a major celebrity like David Carradine dying under very suspicious circumstances, they're mm-hmm. going to cover that up to the nth degree, you know, and mm-hmm. just try to run it under the carpet. So yeah. I wasn't surprised to hear all of that. But it, uh, this has been, what, 12, 13 years now. Has anything yeah. been resolved for you or is it just... Still an open uh, well, case, for me or? personally, I, I, you know, writing the book and getting it out was very cathartic, and I helped me close, you know, um, a chapter, you know, uh, no pun intended, um, in, with the whole thing. Um, not to mention the epiphany I had with Dr. Drew Pinsky, um, but I, you know, when I investigated, I was dogged to find out answers and whatnot because it, it wasn't. What was in the press, I just got, it was like, no, that's not, something's missing here. Mm. And um, and it was the way things were worded, and, and I, I received a copy of the autopsy, and things in there didn't jive. And um, I even called, you know, the coroner pretending I was a, a writer for a TV show and giving him a scenario and said, well, would this, in the autopsy, what would that mean? If I was writing a scene, would that be... Uh, accidental death or would that be in with intent to kill and the answer was um, intent to kill so it was like wow okay maybe I can still get some answers get publicity out there maybe somebody will come forward with some more information but nothing nothing did and then I found the, um, the surveillance footage that was supposed to be sent to um, would have been to the legal team, um, and that footage was supposed to have been sent over, but for whatever reason, which I have no idea why, it never was. And then I was told when I connected with the police department over there in Thailand again, the file was permanently closed, along with the footage. Yeah, well, that I'm not. So you go, yeah. well, okay, great. Did and I, I, I ha- it was a lot for me to try and and let go of that, as I was just like, I, this is not right. F- for him, um, call it me being a Libra or whatever, but it, it just, in spite of everything that happened, what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. And um, everybody has their faults. Um, you know, his thing that he did with the family member, it was, you know, a lesson for them to karmically whatever work out. And, and um, it, you know, I, I let go of that, and I thought, no, I really want to have answers to set the to set this right. There's just something has to be done about this, and unfortunately, there's no resolve to really what happened. Okay, that was my there's question. A lot of different scenarios. Yes, but there's yeah. no there's no conclusion at this point. No, no. So it's anybody's guess, people's theories, yep. and yep. people who knew it's him like that. Marilyn Monroe or John K. What really? What happened, really happened? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It'll be one of those. Um, perpetuity uh, mysteries. I see John um, Edwards' name on here as well. He was yes. one that I did interview that I remember quite clearly. I saw that on your site. Yes. Yeah. Um, so what did he, he have to awesome. say? He he, he we we had a reading arranged uh, for his show, um, and and the 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 date of the he was supposed to come to the house and do the reading, which he did. But it was uh, David uh, moved all his things out like two days before, and I, I couldn't, I, I, I wanted that reading so bad, <laughs> and I didn't tell them, and so they came in the house to do the show, and, and, um, and David was scheduled to, to show up, I mean, in, and, but the, like most of the furniture was out and everything, and, and I took John aside, and I said, uh, you know, David moved out like two days ago, and he said, I know that, but the mission for me being here, he said, this reading was really for you, not for David. And I'm like, wow, hmm. okay. And nobody came through for David, but my dad and my uncle and uh, people came through for me on that reading. So it was very interesting. But more interesting things came through the reading that John gave, and he was, man, he was spot on. It was just really awesome. 
Well, did David was um, still alive when John did the reading? Oh, yeah. It oh, was oh, just oh, a few oh. days after we separated. Oh, I see. Okay. In so, 2001. Okay, well, I'm confused then. What was the point of the reading? I thought this was all done after David's death. To try no, to no, 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 no. Um, no, it, the point of the reading was um, for his show, you know, he, he um, gave reading for celebrities. Oh, and, oh um, yeah, yeah, okay. And right. David and I wanted to get a reading from John. And so he, um, he, he arranged, you know, when he was in California to um, have us as part of his, his show. So that's how that happened. And, and he, he said to me, you know, basically, like, you, you guys are going to get a divorce. It's like there's no repairing this. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, all right. Okay. No, I was just confused. Yeah. I, I know he talked about that in the interview <clears throat> about doing Other celebrities. Psychics, uh, and, after David yeah. died that I consulted in astrologers like, you know, like um, Michael Bodine, Sloan Bella, um, Weiss Kelly, Donna Hennon. Um, they all came forward, and it's in the book, um, what they said and the details of the information. I, I've grown up in the, the parapsychology world, you know, ever since I was in kindergarten, pretty much. I, I had visions and things and was psychic of my own, and I was trying to find answers and um, had a reading with Jean Dixon when she was at the Hollywood oh, Bowl and, and things like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, I've been to, like, those famous ones, and I, I've connected with, through the publicity, too, um, some really reputable and um, really accurate psychics, clairvoyants, and astrologers. So um, they all gave me some information, and it really helped put some pieces together, as well as mend a lot of the spiritual loose ends, so to speak. Oh, that's great. So what are you working yeah. on now? The company is your primary... Uh, um, I'm doing the publicity. Yeah. I have a, you know, wonderful clients. I'm, I'm Scott Hamilton Harris, um, building construction group. I know it's kind of odd, like you think entertainment, but he's done so many shows like... Um, um, the news and Spectrum TV, and I mean, he's been all over the place and um, incredible estate. He actually, uh, his company built Ed Begley Jr.'s lead platinum green home. Oh. And um, so I'm still doing the publicity, and as well as um, I'm writing children's books. I, I finished my first, and I'm you know now pursuing the agent, <laughs> the agent hunt. And I'm also trying to get the book um, produced, you know, to get it on screen, the story. It's, it's really a, a, it doesn't sound like it right now, but it's, it really is a love story between the two of us and how we met, how that all came about, and, and, and our journey together to get him back on top. Because I, I introduced him to Quentin Tarantino and, and courting that and how it led to Kill Bill. There's so much misinformation about that on the Internet and things, but... Um, it um, it was quite a journey, so I'm hoping to get that on the screen. And um, like you said, it's like you know, it's an unsolved mystery as to what happened to him. Well, it, it sounds exactly like a Quentin Tarantino film, the whole story. <laughs> no, it's not, not as violent <laughs> as Quentin's <laughs> film, but well, it could um, be. I mean, they could they could you know put some gratuitous violence in there, like Hollywood always does. But no, I mean, just it. It has a very Hollywood esque feel oh, yeah. to yeah. it. Yeah, you know? definitely. Well, it's all filled with Hollywood. And it's people. filled with Hollywood people. I mean, David Carradine <laughs> is a famous right. name. So. The, the Carradine dynasty. Yeah. So I, I think that. Uh, have you had any success or in talks or is it still in the shop? I've been in or? talks off and on for years. It's just nothing has felt right. Um, it's uh, they don't want to slant it a particular way that just is like mm, mm, no, this is no. So I think things have changed now, and um, I'm starting to you know put the feelers back out there. Um, so we'll see. You know, um, I think it deserves to be on the on the screen, whether it's a you know limited series or or what. Um, that that doesn't matter to me. It's just the point is to get his story out there. Did you want to and, do it as a feature film or as a documentary? I don't see it as a documentary. Um, you could say a biopic maybe, but um, it would definitely for the, it could be the big screen. It depends on, on the, the take of whoever's producing. Okay. Um, there's enough material for a limited series. Like Netflix? Yeah. That kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazon, Netflix. Yep, yep. Uh, they put great, great content. Apple TV, all of them. We do have to Putting wind this up. 
Uh, Trying to solve the mystery. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Do you have a website <laughs> you want to give out, either a personal one, one for the book, one for your company? Or? Um, I'm, I'm trying to find time to revamp my own. <laughs> Honestly, it's just been crazy. Um, it's just marinaanderson.com. Uh, that's my, my personal. It's, um, you know, just redoing the whole thing. But, uh, but, but it's fair. Okay. And, um, yeah, the Media Hound PR um, is the company. And you're on social and, media. Uh, yeah. I'm on social media. And, um, yeah, and then hopefully I'll get to my uh, children's books going. Because that's, uh, I love kids, and I've taught and coached kids for years and years, and it's been a, a just a lovely journey for me to work with kids. And, um, and now, now it's time to write some inspirational books for them. Are these so. like teaching books? What, what, what's the idea? What's mm, the concept? Um, not so much teaching books. The first one I finished actually is uh, for a young reader. It's more like a, a very la- a lassie-like story. Because it stars my beloved colleague Lulu, oh, okay. and um, but it's a very lassie-like story. But the other ones are, are more picture, picture books and um, a learning kind of thing, but with an inspirational twist to them. Um, you know, positive um, affirmations and thoughts and things you can create using your imagination, kind of thing. Well, thank you so much for coming <laughs> yeah. on the show. Okay, and sharing. <laughs> Well, they sound interesting. I just, I don't have kids, and I don't think it would be something I would get. But uh, I don't either. <laughs> I, that was one very heartbreaking thing that never happened for me and with David. And yeah. we tried, and I also wrote about that, too, for people who are out there trying, um, and it's not working. Ask your, ask your doctor for an antibody cross-match test. Um, we found that out at the very end, and... Um, that was the problem. It wasn't me. It wasn't him. It was the cross-match antibody. What does that mean? And it means, um, it, to kind of nutshell it in very lay terms, it was <laughs> explained to me, if the bands are too much the same between the, the male and female, it creates a rejection factor, and you can't hold the pregnancy. And it's not because a woman's infer- infertile or anything physically or anything with the man. It is in the blood, in how it reacts. That's interesting. I've never heard of that. Mm. Yeah, it's a $150 blood test. There's a few places in the United States that does it. Went to a doctor that sent it out, and he goes, comes back and goes, this is your problem. And we actually went under, um, it was an experimental program um, that Dr. Bronte Stone was uh, involved with, and to get the leukocytes and the antibodies back up so you, you know, retain the the pregnancy and went through IVF. I mean, I went through like procedures galore and, and um, it didn't happen. And they later um, shut down the program because the FDA wanted to get involved in calling the, the blood from the donor, which would have been David's blood. They wanted to call it a, a drug. And I, I couldn't help but laugh. I went, he would have loved that. They had, had his blood being called a drug. <laughs> <laughs> Because he was into the you know marijuana and, and you know in his LSD days and in, in the seventies days with Laurel yeah. Canyon and all that, so he he would have found that humorous. Um, so so that program was shut down. But it, there are places outside of the United States that are still working on that. So that's my suggestion to anybody out there listening who might be having that problem to check that out. Good advice, I think, and something that probably nobody's ever heard of. I, I right, because yeah. there's so, there's a lot of money in IVF. Yeah. It's a huge money maker. Why would they suggest something simple like that to check out when they can make all that money? We spent about sixty thousand dollars on that whole, you know, endeavor to have a kid. Mm. He had his children. I never had any, and there was I know like had fifteen embryos going. I'm Italian, Sicilian background. There was nothing wrong with that. It was the antibodies. What about, so, have you ever thought of sperm bank? I, I, I tried that after we separated, and um, it, it, it kind of creeped me out because it's unknown, and um, I didn't have any friends at the time who wanted to be a dad, you know. So, um, and it obviously didn't work, and I just, and I thought, you know, I'm going through so much. I, it wouldn't be right or fair to a kid to bring them up um, under the circumstances. I, and the window was closing 
at that point. So um, I gave up. I, I closed the door and just kind of. So sperm bank, you don't uh, know. You don't know what you're getting. They don't tell you. Well, you do to an extent, to a great extent. I mean, um, there's a. Uh, I did one of them through UCLA. You get a profile, and you can the hair color and the, their profession or what they're doing. I mean, it was quite intense. You know, oh, okay. your choices, mm. uh, kind of mind boggling actually. And um, but but you don't know the person. Right? You know, to me, that's. The most important. I know. Someone that it doesn't them. really yeah. matter to me. It, it didn't feel that right, but I did try it because I really wanted to have a baby. But um, which we his own, right? So yeah, you know, there's wonderful opportunities out there for women who want to do it that way. I mean, Especially I, now they can freeze the egg. But when I was right. doing it, you couldn't freeze. They didn't have the knowledge to freeze the egg at that time. Um, you could freeze the embryos, but now they've got the wherewithal with science and medicine to be able to kind of like. Put that on hold for a while. You know, it's amazing what they've accomplished. <laughs> this is probably one of the longer goodbyes that we've had. <laughs> Never thought we'd get into that territory, did you? <laughs> <laughs> we went from children's and books to sperm to banks. welcome to the medical science show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, thanks again for coming on. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. And uh, best of luck with everything. I hope to see this as Thank a film. You. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much.